Amen. Well, let's just pray to receive the word this morning. Just pray with me and say, Father God, Father God I want to learn how. I want to learn how. Take those things you've given me. Take those things you've given me. And give them back to you. Give them back to you. As an offering of praise and thanksgiving. As an offering of praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I tend to like to preach in series, although I don't always do that, but if I told you everything I wanted to say about a subject, we'd be here for hours and hours and hours. So okay. I try to break it a little that's okay, they said. I try to break it in little pieces. <laughs> but we've had this has been a big subject. The the series that I've been sharing is called Success in Life, and there's a lot to that. Number one, the, the biggest the biggest enabler of success in life is knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We just saw a great man of God laid to rest, Reverend Billy Graham, 90 years, 99 years old. 99 years old, praise God. He preached to millions and millions of people. I think they said it was like 100 or 200 million people actually sat before him and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give the Lord a hand clap and praise him. Amen. Well, when I preach in series, I want you to, hopefully, you'll see how things kind of dovetail. One message builds a little bit on the, on the backside of the other. Um, if you've missed some, you can listen to our, our messages on our Facebook channel. Jeff usually gets them posted on there. On our, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And uh, sometimes you might want to listen to more, one more than once because there's a lot of meat in here. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know we're having a fellowship dinner in just a little bit, but I intend to feed you good before you get out of here. So. Oh, Amen. Uh -huh. The scripture that I've, I've shared every message in this series is John 10.10. 10. It says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. Folks, when you have forces working on your life or against you that are stealing, killing, and destroying, those are the paw prints of the devil himself or his emissaries. God brings us into his kingdom deliberately, as I shared. You know there are no accidents. Um, and I want, we need to understand that because if we don't understand God's deliberate plan was to bring you to Himself, then you're going to question who you are and what you're able to do for Him. Because what I think the Lord hears the most when He tries to open a door for somebody to serve Him, they say, well, you can't meet me, God, or I can't do that, or, you know, find somebody else. I know none of you say that, right? But there are no accidents. He knows the future and the past. He sees our whole lives like an open book. And I shared these scriptures last week. But I'm going to share them again. And they're in the, the Gospel of John 6.37. Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. John 6.44 No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How do we come to Jesus? The Father is drawing us through the Holy Spirit. And I will raise him up in the last day. And again he said, this is three times Jesus said it in the, in the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter. In verse 65 he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. So the Father draws us. It has to be granted. Folks, here's the bottom line. Make sure you understand this. It was God's decision to bring you to Himself. Amen? Amen? And He brought you to Himself for a purpose. He wasn't just filling a quota, you know? Um, he just didn't say, oh, I just need two more people. He made you and formed you for a specific purpose. He allowed you to develop gifts and talents in your life. But he meant those for his glory. Amen? Amen? Amen. Ephesians 2 and 8 and 10 tells us that. It says, For by grace <clears throat> you have been saved through faith, 
And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. At least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He creates us, he brings us, and draws us into his kingdom, and he does it, why? Because he has good works, <coughs> excuse me, that he intends us to walk in. Now sometimes in our lives we walk in something else, and I won't draw any pictures <laughs> for you there. Needless to say, I've been watching my my son and daughter-in-law's dog, so I'm careful not to step in things. <laughs> but sometimes in life you step in it. But that's not what God wants. Amen? He wants you to walk in those good works. Boy, that's a bad illustration. Sometimes <laughs> using that one. Amen. Turn and tell your neighbor you're better off walking in good works than stepping in it. Amen. Because when we go and do our own thing and we don't really dedicate the gifts and talents and things that we've done for the Lord, instead of walking in good works, what are we doing? We're stepping in it all the time. Okay. So we don't come into the kingdom of God to be served. I hate to disappoint you. God didn't say, come on in, and I'm going to wait on you for the rest of your natural life. We come into the kingdom of God to follow, to follow Jesus' own example of servanthood. He was Lord of all, but he humbled himself, didn't he? He became a servant. Right. And we're called, called to be servants of God to walk in those good works. God has prepared in advance for us to walk in. You see, I think it's become popular in Christianity today to reverse things. Instead of bringing people into the kingdom and saying, God's got a job for you to do, that he made you for a purpose. People are being brought into the kingdom today it's to make your life better, for God to serve you, to take care of your needs, your wants, your hurts. Well, you know what? The master does take care of his servants. Amen? Amen. But this, the servants, the master doesn't exist just to take care of the servants. His servants are there to serve the master, to do a purpose. Amen. Here's a scripture to back that up. I always like to put a scripture to back up things I say. As a matter of fact, you say, Pastor, you stuff so many scriptures in there sometime before service, I get scared you're going to preach until midnight. <laughs> Luke 17.7, 7, it says, <coughs> excuse me, when a servant comes in from plowing or taking care of the sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, prepare my meal, put on your apron, Serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Well, let me back up again. What does he say? Prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. Who gets fed first? The master or the servant? The master, doesn't he? Amen? Yeah? You know when we pray, do we pray and ask God what he wants us to do first? Or do we pray and ask God for what we need first? Just think about it for a minute. Maybe if you ask God what He needs, the Master who knows all things would take care of your needs. You wouldn't have to ask Him. Amen? And does the Master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Some people serve the Lord and say, Lord, I did all this stuff for you. And what thanks do I get? We really don't need any thanks, do we? He's God and we're not. Amen? It says, of course not. <coughs> In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are worthy servants who have simply done our duty. Amen. Yeah. We haven't done anything special. We've just done our duty. What's our duty? It's very simple. Our duty is whatever God made us to do. We're going to look at that in just a minute. You know, one of the past messages in this series was entitled, Abundant Life Through Giving. You know how to be miserable? Anybody want to learn the secret to be miserable? I can tell you right here. It, works. It, is, it is foolproof. It will never fail you. If you do this, you can be miserable even on good days. 
Amen? You could be miserable no matter how well things go. If you follow my secret recipe here, you will be miserable no matter what. <laughs> what you have to do to be miserable is to focus on yourself. I guarantee you will be miserable. Matter of fact, spend as much time as you can looking in the mirror. And you'll be saying to the person looking back, Oh, what a miserable person I am. But you know, the Bible says in Luke 6.38, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down. Shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured back to you. You know, you can't outgive God. And I'm not just talking about your finances. God wants your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen? He wants your time. He wants your care. He wants your prayers. You can't give more to God than He will give back to you. They try it. See how far you get. <laughs> Abundant life flows to us from what we give, not from what we receive. And by giving, I mean giving ourselves to God's service, His purpose, His plan for our lives. We've each have been uniquely fashioned by the Lord for His purpose and plan. And abundant life comes to us as we fulfill or give ourselves to those things. How do you get abundant life? You give ourselves, we give ourselves to those things that God has made us to do for Him. Now you can do things for yourself. But I'm saying that the Lord gave us good works to, to walk in. And by giving... It means giving ourselves over to God's service. Do you have a hobby or a pastime or something that you really like to do? I bet you could probably do it if it's a legal enterprise. Okay? <laughs> and give it to God. Do it for His glory. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I read an article in the uh, magazine Christianity Today. Some of you probably read that particular publication that had a definition of success that was so simple. I've never heard one as concise and as simple. <clears throat> it said success is the person who does the most with what he's got. That's success. Isn't that a simple definition? Doing the most with what you have. Success, that's success. It means whatever you have, whatever skills, whatever abilities and willingness to work, Put it to good use wherever the Lord calls you to do it. Now, we're living in a country today that measures the unemployment rate. Every state and the national, they measure the employment, unemployment rate. It's down one of the lowest it's been in 45 years. That's an awesome thing. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. That's a good thing. Isn't that a good thing? That the unemployment rate... The unemployment rate right now for certain minorities, blacks, Hispanics, is the lowest it has ever been recorded. That's unbelievable. That means that people have jobs. The, the amount of people that uh, require assistance has dropped down too to our lowest level. Why? Because they're, they're working. How many people believe that full employment is good for America? Amen? Isn't that good? Amen. That's a great thing. You know, the kingdom of God does have an unemployment rate. <laughs> but it's only because people aren't going to work. Mm -hmm. There's a job for everybody. Amen? Amen? It's zero. As a matter of fact, the unemployment rate for the kingdom of God should be zero. There should be more things to do than people to do that. And that's why you have little kids coming up in the world, walking in those good works. We need to just be willing to take our skills and abilities and put them to God, good use. You say, well, I can't do anything but pray. You know, prayer is one of the biggest things that you can do. Amen? Prayer moves mountains, moves heaven and earth. <clears throat> so what is success? It's doing the most with what you've got. And, the, you know, we serve a Lord that, that is going to return. How many people believe that Jesus is coming back? I know today is popular to preach, oh, he's going to be back tomorrow, and you better be ready. We, then no man knows the day or the hour. If somebody says he's going to be back, I remember 1988, there was somebody down in Sacred Melody Bookstore, I shouldn't probably use the name, but uh, they were having a lecture down there, and the guy had 88 reasons why the Lord was going to be back in 88. Some people remember that. 
He, he spoke, he gave all these reasons, and I'm listening to the scripture saying, that's not right. You're, you're not, you're not, you're taking things out of context. And well, the Lord didn't return in 1988, and he gave away all his money and things. My only regret going to that lecture, if I got to him sooner, I said, give it to me if you're not going to need it. <laughs> but he's going to come back at some time. But you know, he doesn't want us sitting around. He wants us to take, be taking our gifts and talents. If I'm in the middle of preaching a sermon and the Lord comes back, oh well. Yep. If you're in the middle of, of praying for your neighbor and the Lord comes back, oh well, that's a good thing. God's not going to say, how come you weren't watching? He's saying, you're a faithful servant. You were out doing your job. Don't worry about it. The Bible says don't look for him. It's like lightning that comes. You know, don't be don't be sitting around and waiting. That happened in the early church. That's why they wrote Second Thessalonians that the day or hour would not come. And you know, unless the the, the one that the the Antichrist basically was exposed beforehand. So there's some signs that are going to take place Amen. before the coming of the Lord. But we're to tarry until He comes. We're going to keep on working until He comes. And when He comes, folks, He'll find you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> in fact, it doesn't matter if your ashes are scattered in the river. Or if you're driving down the road in your car, he's going to find you. Don't worry about it. He knows those that are his. Amen. <laughs> Lord, for that praise. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 8, <coughs> excuse me, we are fully confident we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. You know, when we're away from the earthly bodies, we're going to be at home from the Lord. But between now and then, the Lord has wonderful good works for us to walk in. Yeah. The good news is that we are all unique and special in God's eyes. And I look around here now, I think we have one person here who's a twin, I know. But you know, even twins aren't the same. They're not the same. Everybody's unique, you know. There's not two mics, there's not two ravens nope. running around. Even if they, they had twins, you know, I used to think Mike and Jeff were twins, but they changed a little bit, so. <laughs> Mike got a little grayer, so that's what happened, and I can tell them. Although I knew you weren't twins when we had that little football game out behind the church and you racked heads together. And Mike, I think your head's harder than poor Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Well, let me not get too far off of my message here. You know, but don't worry. Let me tell you something up front. Don't worry about what other people are doing because you're not other people. Turn and tell your neighbor you're definitely one of a kind. And we're each fashioned by God to enjoy our unique, abundant life by giving our gifts and talents and things back to God. Jeremiah 1.4, and I, I quoted this again, and I want to hit it one more time. I quoted it last week, I believe. It says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. What does that mean? It means that before you were born, each one of us, God knew you. He knew what, how you were going to turn out. He could see your whole life. He drew you to Himself. He had a plan in mind when He puts you together in your mother's womb. And it says for Jeremiah, He ordained him to be a prophet to the nations. Well, Jeremiah was a good prophet. The people didn't listen to him, but he was a great prophet and said exactly what God wanted him to do. And I'm sure God said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yeah. When the end of Jeremiah's days. So what am I saying? I'm saying that you are no accident. I had a, a friend of mine who's gone home to be with the Lord. Some of you knew him. Man of God. Loved him dearly. Donald Boyce. I know some of you remember Donald. And he was a big guy. And he used to, he'd wear t-shirts. And I remember this one t-shirt he wore. And it, it had a big, I don't know what was on it, but it said, God didn't make any junk. <laughs> And it was like pointing to himself or something. 
You know? And we have to be careful to say that. We have to understand that God did not make any junk. Because the devil will get your will get your self-confidence right down in the pits. He'll convince you that you're worthless, that you're no good, that God would never want to use you. But you know what? Turn and tell your neighbor, God didn't make any junk. God didn't make any junk. And He certainly didn't call any junk back to Himself. Amen? <clears throat> we are His handiwork. You know, when we come into the kingdom of God with some degree of knowledge and natural abilities that we're, that we're born with, some things we learn to do. Now, I can play guitar a little bit and try to sing, although I was coughing a little bit. You know, um, but I didn't come out of the womb with a guitar. I learned how to play the guitar. I didn't. <laughs> Even though I was little, I was only like four and a half pounds. I couldn't wait to be born. A little early. Um, yeah, thank God he didn't come out with a guitar. Ouch. <laughs> but I remember, you know, your life is no accident. The things you learn to do. I had a, have an older sister, four years older than me, that's had accordion lessons for years and dropped it. My parents paid for lessons. The guy would come to the house and give her lessons. And he was quite the teacher. Of course, my mother would feed him lunch or dinner or whatever. You know. We didn't realize there was something a little off about him until one day he got in the back seat of his car and put the keys into the front of the back seat or the back of the front seat to start it and realized in the back. I guess he used to drink a little bit, so. Good teacher, though. He was all right for a teacher, but she dropped that. So I grew up and said, I'd like to learn to play something like a drums or something. They said, forget it. We're not, we did that. We paid for lessons for your sister. We're not going to give you lessons. And of course, you know, kids know how to tease. So I teased and teased. I wanted drums. And then I said, well, I had some cousins that played guitar that were quite a bit older than me. You know, I was a little kid. And they bought me an old guitar. I mean, this thing, the strings were so far off the neck, you had to be Hercules to press them down. I learned to play it. And I learned to play because I never had a lesson. I didn't have anybody. I watched how they put their fingers. And I had them draw out some chord charts. When I would get together on rare occasions with my cousins, I'd stand there and I'd watch them and I'd mimic what they would do. And by the time I was about 12, I could play pretty well, you know. Why did that happen? Because God had a plan. He obviously didn't want me to be a professional musician, but he knew that I'd be playing music. That was one of the things I'd be doing for him. Amen. And when I got saved at 24 years of age, I played, you know, guitar and Oh my gosh, all my songs were old. I knew country music and different things and, you know, playing parties and all that. And, and uh, they handed me, said, you play guitar? Can you play some Christian uh, songs? I said, well, I don't really know any, you know. And after I got saved, so I started playing at a whole prayer meeting and then one thing led to another and then I was playing for full gospel businessmen meetings with a guy who was a bass player who, he was a professional musician, so that helped a lot. Um, then we started traveling, I went to different retreat centers and played, we played at big coffee houses in Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, and played and sang, and then, uh, of course, I didn't preach at all, I never did any preaching until the guy with me said, Scott's going to share a message. <laughs> I didn't know I could, but then I found out, hey, I can do this, you know. But God has a way of using whatever you have in the kingdom. Whatever you have, he'll use it. And you know, I remember in college, the one thing I said I never wanted to do, and I graduated summa cum laude from college. I was a very good student, just came very easy for me. And... Uh, said, the one thing I'll never do is sales. Guess what I went to work in? Yeah. Sales. But God knew I needed to be in sales because I, I needed to learn how to speak to people, give presentations. And so, I don't know, sharing the gospel really isn't a sale, but you have to deal with people. You know, so all that experience kind of transferred over. But God's what I'm trying to show you by using myself as an example is don't think badly about the things in your life, the, the skills and talents and abilities that you have. I remember when we first started the church and we had the building in Sandy Creek. 
I met with some other pastors. We used to have these ecumenical meetings. They said, what are you doing? What kind of ministry? I said, I'm painting. I'm doing carpentry. I'm doing plumbing. And they laughed. Because I was working inside the building. That's all I was doing. But, you know, even swinging a hammer. Thank God. When we got the building we were in, this building right here, and we closed on the deal, okay? They took our bid, and it was our building. It's been turned off for years. I went down in the basement. I'm going to turn the water on. <laughs> Hallelujah. I still remember that. I still. It was late in the evening. And I turned, the, we have water pressure. This was an old school. We could, we could send you up in the air on a fire hose with this place. It's got a lot of pressure. I turned that water on, and there were tears coming down my eyes, and there was water spraying every place down the basement. They had not blown the lines out properly. Oh. It was leaking all over the place, and I'm like, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to do? I, I can't. And uh, I called up Ben. Now, we started the church. He was just a little kid. You shut you it know? off again, yeah. I shut it off again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it had to be fixed or we weren't going to have church. <coughs> I said, what am I going to do? I called him up. I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. He says, don't worry about Dad. I'll come over with my torch. Well, and he had gone to school for HVAC. If he hadn't gone to school for HVAC, we wouldn't have the heat system running down the walls. We wouldn't, I mean, we wouldn't have been able to even keep the building. It would have cost so much if we had to hire all that. We've got some other folks, too, that, that do plumbing and things. But Ben came over, and we were there till I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning. He was soldering pipe. Fixed all the leaks. <coughs> you know, just, it's amazing. Now, did God know that my son was going to go to school for HVAC and it was going to be needed? Yeah. Yeah, he also put air conditioning in our last building. From a unit that was damaged and thrown out, he fixed it and hooked it up. So, it's an awesome, awesome thing. The things that, that God can do. <coughs> What is success? It's simply doing the most with what you got. What's the problem that most people have? Is they, they focus on not what they have. They focus on what they haven't got. They look at somebody else and say, oh, I don't know. You know, uh, look what so-and-so can do. I can never do that. God may not want you to do that, you know? It's an amazing, amazing thing. I know we're in the process of finishing up the, well, getting going on the handicapped bathroom. And uh, Ben came up the other night and finished, knocked the rest of that wall out. It's now out behind the building on the patio there. <laughs> but we'll be put, putting that in soon. But you know, if it wasn't for, for the people that can do things around here. We've got two, two lawnmowers to mow the lawn with. If it wasn't for Bob there, we'd have two yard ornaments. <laughs> That's, and a yard ornament does nothing to get rid of your grass, okay? I mean, God uses what we have. He even sent, we've got a guy that just came in and said, <coughs> that's a mason that was looking at our brickwork. You know, they call the points in between the bricks, the mortar, they call those the points. And this really needs to be repoint, repointed. We've got somebody, that's what he does. God sent him in, that's his job. He does restorations. He's an expert at it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. God can use whatever talents you have. You know, we've, had, we've got new doors put in, and how many people worked on those? Bill and everybody else. You know, and the shed and all the different things you do. You say, what does that have to do with ministry? Well, it's hard to minister if you don't have a roof over your head. It's hard to minister if there's no bathroom that works. Amen? Or no water. And, and so many people have so many gifts and talents and abilities. It's just awesome. And uh, we have to remember that every gift and talent can be put to use for, for God. Even if you look at, look at your bulletin. Did you see the picture I put in the front of your bulletin? What's the guy holding in his hand? A camera. Do you know a camera is a ministry? Amen. 
I don't care what you do, you have to remember, ministry is bigger than just sharing the gospel. Ministry is taking what you have and making the most out of it. And I was so blessed to come in and see the, the cross and the flowers and, and different things that were put in here. They just magically appeared, I think, on sometime on Saturday after I left. I think the friend might have stuck in here. I don't know. But that's an awesome thing. Isn't that awesome? Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I know. I'm extremely thankful. Amen. Amen. And you know, it's, it's an amazing thing when, when one isn't able to do something or it gets pulled out or gets, you know, gets a little bit of a broken ankle there. Somebody else steps up and does the job. This church has done bigger projects with fewer people than anybody. Amen. I remember being up in Watertown, and this was a huge church. I'd say they were 50 times our size. They were having a march for Jesus, just one. And I talked to somebody, I went up to it, and I said, that's great. They said, we can't do it, this is too big of a project. They had probably 500 people going to church there. We put on two of them with our little church. Imagine that. You know what the difference is? Everybody takes what they're able to do and does it. Hallelujah. And thank God for the ones in MJ and, and Virginia and, and Bonnie and Colleen and stuff that can, you know, with a little bit of a hospitality ministry that I got shorted in. Because <laughs> you guys are able to do things. We did the we did the music outreaches and music festivals and all that and chicken barbecues and stuff. That it takes a lot of work, but using what you have is a great way to reach out. Yep. In Luke 19, <laughs> verse 11 through 27, <clears throat> it says the crowd was listening to everything Jesus said. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right away. They thought it was going to happen tomorrow. He said, a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and return. Well, who is the nobleman that was called away? Jesus. Jesus was the one telling the story, and he was using himself as the example in there. Nobleman was called away to a distant <coughs> empire. <coughs> the Lord's been crowned king. He ascended up into heaven, and he's going to return. And verse 13 says, Before he left, he called together ten of his servants and divided among them ten pounds of silver, saying, Invest this for me while I'm gone. <coughs> now in this parable, Jesus is dividing up silver among them. Okay? And when Jesus, when I asked Jesus into my heart, well, we'd have a lot of people saved if I say, if you, when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I'm going to give you bags of silver. People would be lining right up. You know how sincere that would be. We don't get bags of silver. We don't, you don't realize the silver that God has given you. He's given you abilities to do things. You know? If you can do plumbing or wiring or mechanical, or if you can, you can clean or preach or do whatever, you can teach. If you can cook, that's a tremendous ministry. I love that one. <laughs> that's silver. He's given each, each one of us silver. Okay? The silver represents our gifts and talents that each one of us have. I got some silver. I don't think it was a huge amount, but I invested it. I've invested it. I just had a, just had a phone call from Doreen Ortipo. Anybody remember Doreen? She called me. Yeah. They're doing very well. Charles has, he has his home church and 14 other churches that he planted. This is in Kenya. This is the guy in a mud hut with a sixth grade education who we invested in, all of us, myself included, who now has a master's degree as a bishop has come and he's, he's got a base here in America now with his family, and he's still going back and doing revivals in Kenya. He's going to keep going back and forth. And you know, God has blessed him. They now have two cars. They have a house. Um, he's just signed a contract with um, Amazon. He's buying a truck. 
He's got a truck. He's going to do the package deliveries at night when he's not ministering. He can do it on contract, so if he needs to go out of town, he can do that. This is a kid that all he had was one suit of clothes and a mud hut that he built himself and used to walk five miles to church to preach, and he only had a sixth grade education. Yeah. He's been around the world, folks, and led thousands and thousands of people. He, he just told me his last trip over there, he was back just in one meeting, they had like 200 people saved right there. <coughs> What does God do when you invest a little silver? All we did, I went over there and did some did some uh, pastoral leadership training. And I guess everybody that was at that thing, their churches grew and blossomed and it just was tremendous. When you invest what God gives you with gifts and talents, it's not you that gives the increase, it's God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Boy, I'm getting off my page here. I better get back. But we've all been entrusted with many gifts. And it's not about titles or you know, positions. Um, it's about doing what you can do with what you have. You know, my, my little grandson Ian there, there's a talent contest at school. So he says, oh boy, I'm gonna do that or a talent show. He's 10 years old. He's learned to play guitar, he plays bass a little bit. He didn't know what to play to show off the bass. I said, I know you can play a song by Creedence. Um, down on the corner, I know the bass line. So I, I taught him that bass line. None of the kids are going to know it, but the teachers will. But I, he, he came up here, was, was helping. I was mopping and cleaning and doing the bolts on Saturday before the church magically got decorated. And he saw, he, he was putting the bolts together. He looked and saw it. Gifts and talents. He said, wow, I'm getting that and I'm going to school and I'm going to go to a talent thing. You know? <laughs> we just have had so many, many things and many people that, that do stuff here. Every born again, do you know if you're a born again Christian, you get a gift? Mm -hmm. we, we give visitors gifts that, that are starting to come to the church. <laughs> God gives us a gift when we come into the kingdom, a spiritual gift. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. <clears throat> there are different kinds of service, but we, all, we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To the one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice to another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives faith to another and to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to serve, whether a message is from the Spirit of God or another Spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. While it is another is, is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Hey, go ahead and pray for more spiritual gifts. He'll probably give you something. But you get something when you come into the kingdom. Amen? And He decides which gifts you, we should have. Why is that? He wants the gifts to be put to use for the good of the body. Let me get back to Luke again. Luke 19, 14, and we'll, we'll start reading. It says, But his people hated him, who was at the, the nobleman who was sent away to be king, and, and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want you to be our king. Well, there are many that have rejected Jesus today, but guess what? He's still king of kings and lord of lords. And he's still coming back. And he's going to rule and reign out of the earth for a thousand years. <clears throat> that doesn't change anything. It says, after he was crowned king, he returned and called into service to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their prophets were. <coughs> the first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You're a good servant. You've been faithful with the little I entrusted to you. So you'll be governor of ten cities as your reward. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. 
I'll make you governor over five cities. The third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I was afraid because you're a hard man to deal with. Taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. Huh. Harvesting crops you didn't plant. You know what? There's some crops in Kenya that we planted. Amen? Amen. But God is going to get the harvest. I don't know. you have any problem with that? I don't. You wicked servant, the king ordered his own word, your own words condemn you. If you knew I'm a hard man who takes what isn't mine and the harvest crops I didn't plant, why didn't you deposit the money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Well, there's not a lot of interest today, a little bit. <coughs> but then turning to the other standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has ten pounds. But master, they said, he already has ten pounds. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Huh. What does that mean? It means that if you invest well, guess what? God gives you more to invest. Yeah. And as for these enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them in and execute them right here in front of me. There's a day coming when those enemies of God are going to all be dealt with. But now we're living in an age of grace. Amen? Amen. God gives each one of us spiritual gifts and talents to put to work. And not every one of us gets the same amount of silver, but everyone can invest what they have for a return in the kingdom. Dorino Tipos, they got a house full of kids, their own kids, where they are over here in America now. But you know, they still have a house full of kids back in Kenya that they're supporting. And she told me about one girl that was abused by her. Well, she was very young, and I won't go into all the details, but she he had severed her fingers. Mm -hmm. One finger on one hand, part on, on the other. And Doreen's trying to raise money so she can learn to do a skill. He's in jail, I guess. He, he went after her machete, and she put her hands up like this, and instead of cutting her head off, he cut her fingers off. And of course, she's with child now because of this guy, because he beat her up and took her away. It's just a horrible thing. But she's, she's ministering to her over there, to a whole bunch of people over there. And you know, what she said is, I could only do so much if we stayed in Kenya, but since we're over here, because they can't earn a lot of money over there. Since we're over here, Charles is working as an associate pastor, and now he's going to start a, a contracting service with Amazon. And plus he does speaking and traveling and they do singing and she's working on her, her records and stuff. But she's not, it's not for them. They're only making more so they can put more in the kingdom. Amen? Amen? Because somebody told me something once, and I think it's true that it says you can't take anything with you. You know? And we really can't. But the gold and silver that God gives us in our lives, our gifts and talents that we have, there's nothing too small. There's nothing too insignificant that you can't use for His kingdom. You know, you might be somebody, I don't know, that's a cab driver. I've seen one or two of those around. Anybody know any cab drivers? That one over there? You think, what could you do in a cab? You know, you can witness to people and pray for them. Yeah. Huh, Dave? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's had an opportunity to do that. Now, I know you blessed the person that you witnessed to, but I guarantee that you've got the, the bigger blessing of the two. Amen. And that's what happens. God will use what you have where you have if you're just willing to invest it for Him. It may just be a few words and some listening. It may be prayer. It may be putting on your tools and doing something. Okay? But God will take what you have. Or it might be cooking. We've got a fellowship dinner coming up right now. Amen. God will take what you have and He'll use it for His glory. Amen. Amen. Let's, let's all stand and I, I'd like a couple to come forward and grab the communion trays. Uh, Mike and MJ, you want to do that?
Just a reminder, we have our annual meeting this Wednesday at 7. We will be uh, cast our ballots for the 2018 church board. <coughs> so I'd encourage all members to be here. It's at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday. It's once a year, so if you miss it, you won't get to come again for another year. We're hoping we're going to have some exciting things coming up this, this coming year. Amen. I'm going to bring it into the kitchen, I think, okay. unless they and call them to come in. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. You're welcome, Mom. Did you say your name was? Joe. And I think one of the most awesome things I found out that you can even minister with your motorcycle. You bet. Praise God. Minister in the hospital, too. You can minister in the hospital, that's right. I need to share, too, I went out this past week and visited with Floyd and Louise. They're in Rome. Together? They're together, yeah. Awesome. They're in a uh, nursing home in Rome. It's called uh, Colonial something. It's on Floyd Ave, which I thought was very funny. So Floyd has got his own name on the street. And they're doing well. They're, you know, Louise is looking good. She's lost some weight. She's feeling better. So... And they're doing physical therapy with her, so she's doing pretty good. Thank you, Lord. Did Floyd know who you were? Yep. At first he was a little out of it, but I, I went, Don was deaconizing with me out there. And uh, he, he got to where he was, you know, with the program and recognizing us. And we sat down and we had, uh, well, they had their lunch. And it was nice, one of the other people that are uh, there, the residents, they wheeled him up, he's in a chair, they wheeled him up to the table, and he, he said grace, which I thought was cool. Oh, Louise got a chance to talk to her daughter because she didn't have a phone, I used a cell phone. And she said, you know, she's been doing the car ministry and she can't do it out there anymore. She said, somebody needs to pick that up. I said, well, I'll let people know. Somebody wants to do that ministry, it's, it needs to be, it's, it, she just isn't able from out there. But if anybody wants to go visit them, they're in Rome. It's not hard to find. Lord, we ask a blessing first on the fellowship meal. We just ask you to bless the food and the fellowship. Lord, we remember that same day that you were betrayed, you took bread that night. When you give it thanks, you break it, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, you took the cup, and when you give it thanks, you said, Take and drink ye all of this, for this is my blood, the cup of my blood, the New Testament, which is shed for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you that we have life through your body and blood. We thank you, Lord. Just raise your hands right now with me, our hand. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord, You've given me gifts and talents. You've entrusted me with silver. To so invest in your kingdom. Lord, I know I have opportunities to use what you've given me so that you can have a, a greater harvest. Let me be aware. Let me invest wisely. Your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 You are dismissed.